Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club, a nonprofit dedicated to bringing ideas and people together over community conversation. Today's program, part of the CMC's long-running Optimal Health series, we're so honored to have presenting sponsors for this series, specifically the Ohio State University Wex Medical Center, Nationwide Children's Hospital, and Ohio Health. The presenting sponsor for today's forum and today's live stream is the Center for Human Kindness by the Columbus Foundation. Thank you so much to all of those wonderful organizations who are supporting human connection. We're also grateful to the National Church Residencies and the Ellis for their support, and we'd like to thank the Columbus Dispatch as well for their live stream. Today's forum, From Solitude to Solidarity, Healing Ohio's Loneliness Epidemic, is an incredible conversation. Human beings were, are wired for social connections. For evidence of this, just look around you. Look at this room of individuals who are gathering. For those who are gathering online, look at the individuals that you have an opportunity to connect with when you're in an office space or in your home. But last year, the Surgeon General declared loneliness and isolation, quote, a public health emergency. Loneliness can increase the risk of premature death to levels comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's huge. Today, we're honored to host a discussion on the loneliness epidemic here in Ohio and its profound health implications, including strategies to build socially connected communities. We're thrilled to welcome today's panelists, Dr. Amy Acton, private practice in preventative medicine, Dr. Whitney Raglan Bignall, for On Our Sleeves, Associate Clinical Director of Nationwide Children's Hospital, Susan DeMichael, the CEO of National Church Residencies, and Dr. Megan Schaubing, Medical Director of Psychiatric Emergency Services for Ohio Health. And a conversation would not be a conversation without a good moderator. Our host, Tracy McCambridge, Director of Art and Resilience for the Wex Center for the Arts. Tracy, welcome to the CMC, and let's take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today and to be here with our esteemed panelists. Social connection and feelings of belonging are truly drivers of health and well-being for all of us. Loneliness is a deceptively complex issue, and I'm sure at some point in your life you found yourself surrounded by people while still feeling alone for a whole host of reasons unique to you and your situation. Uh, for the purposes of today's conversation, and this is something that we discussed in advance, we would like to invite you to consider this nuanced social issue through an ecological lens. What does that mean? So um, when you consider this issue of loneliness, first we need to recognize that we are all interconnected at a whole variety of levels and through different channels. Um, Loneliness is about relationships, not just having them, but the quality of them. And as individuals, we are continuously growing and evolving in our relationship to ourselves, but also the people around us. We, um, we impact and are impacted by our self-talk, our relationship with our family and friends, our relationship with our coworkers, our relationship with our workplace, the businesses and organizations in our community, all the way out to the macro level of public policy and laws that impact us. Impact goes from micro to macro and back again. And this panel and how and where we show up within this issue of loneliness in our community is a reflection of that um, ecology. I'm here because I get to create super cool programs at the Wexner Center for the Arts with the core intention of supporting our participants' well-being while we dig into the arts and connect as a group and explore creativity in a variety of ways. 
the arts tap into our humanity and allow us to look critically at how we relate to others, ourselves, and the world around us. And this work wouldn't be possible, though, and these programs wouldn't be successful if they weren't collaborative across sectors. So I get to work with artists, I get to work with social workers, um, healthcare professionals, along with the very people that these programs are meant to support. So students at The Ohio State University, military veterans, people living with chronic illness, and beyond. And so we get to learn from each other in this work, which is really exciting. And I'm so excited to continue that learning today. And so to kick us off, I wonder, Dr. Acton, if you could maybe level set for us a little bit and, and help us to understand some of the research that has been coming out around loneliness and its impact on all of us. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful to be back here um, at home and with this incredible panel. I. Um, Ah, another public health problem, right? I, you might not want to see me, but you know, one of the things we know from the pandemic, there really um, has never been something that has so untethered us, unmoored us. It disrupted every supply chain. It, it affected every life, and nobody has gone through this unscathed. And that said, you know, people think a lot about the polarization we're living in and the disruption, but my experience of the pandemic in the beginning in Ohioans was love was so much greater than the hate. I, I can't tell you enough, and I have the privilege of going around the country, going around the state, hearing story after story, and these are stories much more of connection and how we helped one another get through. And so, to me, when the Surgeon General came out in 2003 uh, with a Surgeon General's advisory on loneliness and isolation, that is what C. Everett Koop did back in my early days of my career, which was smoking. And we've done these for things like obesity and then, and, and then addiction um, and the opiate epidemic. Um, so to do it on something that felt like softer, and then when you dug in, it was beyond profound. This is over 20 years of data collection all across the world. So the trends we are seeing began far, much farther back. Um, he says that loneliness is much more than you know, just a feeling. Um, loneliness is actually a natural response of our body, just like hunger and thirst. Um, it's there for a reason. It's like putting your finger on the stove, you have a reflex, like pull off. So when you first feel loneliness, which all of us do, um, it causes you to often want to reach out and reconnect because we have been so hardwired to need one another to survive. So it's just that basic. So that early response draws you to people. But if it is chronic and longer lasting, um, that begins to become something that changes your physiology, um, your psychology, and even your behavior. Some people withdraw, others lash out uh, when they're feeling that. And we think a lot about folks who fall through the cracks. Um, we certainly think about aging population, which has a high incidence of being alone, but youth feel the most lonely. I mean, it's, the data is very startling. Um, and you say all of this to say heart disease, 15 packs of cigarettes, I mean, 15 cigarettes a day, six drinks a day, more than obesity can predict your mortality and that you die sooner. So it, it, it's a profound underlying root cause and of all these diseases of despair that lay over top of it. Um, it will sound simple now, but 20 years from now, I think we'll have a fundamentally different way of looking at our well-being. And the good news is, you don't do an advisory unless there's something you can do about it. And there are things we can do as individuals and things we can do collectively. And you're going to be hearing many, many examples that are already underway. There's an antidote, and that is connection and compassion 
and care for one another. And boy, we know we need that more than ever right now. So thanks. Absolutely. How does loneliness show up in the people that I know you all work with? When you're talking with someone, and they might not say explicitly like, oh God, I'm really lonely. I feel really socially isolated. How do you know that, or, or kind, of, kind of get the vibe that someone needs connection? Well, I work with young kids up to, so zero to 21 is where I see my patients and families. And oftentimes kids will say things to me like, I don't have any friends, or I don't trust the people I'm around. Um, I stay to myself, that's where I'm good. And many times when they say those words to me, it's like a, a red flag that they're probably not connected as much as they need to be. And even though they say they don't need friends, oftentimes they want them, um, but they don't know how to have them or they don't know who to trust to let into that sphere for them. And I think in the emergency department, um, throughout really all of Ohio and probably throughout the country, we see people in their worst moment, people that come in with mental health crises and, and they come to the ED because there's nowhere else for them to go. And they're at that moment where they just feel stuck and they feel so hopeless and it's so humbling connecting with somebody when they're in that worst moment. And it's probably what I love the most about my job. And what so many people say in that moment is, there's just no hope, there's no future. And so oftentimes it's because there is nobody that they feel cares about them. And you can't even imagine what an impact it can be if there's just one single person you know, one single reason to live, we call it within, you know, suicide prevention, we want that one reason to live. And for some people, it may be a child, it may be a neighbor, um, it may even be a pastor or, or just someone that was kind to them. And so we really see every single day working with people and with mental health crises, the importance of having social support, of having somebody who cares um, somebody who m will make you feel that you matter. Um, what I would add, so I work with National Church Residences and we have the honor and privilege of serving older adults in housing and in services. And I think your question was, when do you know if an older adult is at that place? And it's funny, I was thinking, often when we know, it's too late because it's already presented as a health issue. And what I love about this conversation is we're talking about the root cause. Often when we find out, we treat the symptoms. We go right to you know life preservation, medication, bringing someone in for treatment, right? But what we're talking about today is even more powerful, and that's because we're talking about the root cause, and that's what I love, because my honest answer is often when I know, it's, it's too late. And it's kind of a tricky thing. I, you know, I know I tend to self-isolate you know, if I'm struggling at all, and a lot of us do, and research has actually shown that chronically lonely people can sometimes avoid social um, connection and, and social interactions. So can we unpack this a little bit? It's tricky. I mean, you were, I know you were saying, uh, like, like, I don't need friends. I don't, like, there are a lot of, there are a lot of self-talk things that happen that, you know, talk us out of connecting with people because it feels scary. So can we kind of dig into that a little bit? Because <clears throat> I think it's so, not funny, but it's ironic, right? Because you want to be around people. Um, but the more you aren't around them, you start to have these thoughts that maybe they don't want you around. Or maybe you're going through too many things and you can't talk to them or it's gonna be too much. Or you just build these stories and these thoughts. And so the more you think those things, the less likely you are to engage, right? And so it becomes this vicious cycle of isolation that your thoughts are now pushing you to be further and further away and not helping you get toward the people we know that can so help you, you know, build the connection you want and need. What role do you see um, technology having in all of this? You know, with 
with COVID, we now have telehealth options. We um, we're zooming a lot, uh, you know, Teams meetings a lot, and we're not in physical space with one another quite as much as we used to be in certain ways. Um, so, what impact are you seeing technology having? So, I think it's a, a double-edged sword, really, because. You know, the positive aspect of technology we saw during COVID where at least we were able to stay in touch with one another. We had previously launched a pretty big telemedicine program across Ohio in our emergency departments and um, other spaces at Ohio Health so that we could connect to our patients no matter where they were. And I think during COVID, people were able to stay connected in that manner. But on the flip side of it, what we see in the emergency department a lot, people coming in in crisis largely due to technology. So for instance, teenagers, we have so many teens who come in um, with suicidal thoughts and they're really at that feeling stuck moment because of bullying that's happening over the internet or because um, they don't feel con connected to others and they see what other people are doing on Facebook and it makes them feel bad about themselves. And so I think really it can work either way and that's something that we have to be aware of, especially with our youth. Yeah, I'm sure we've all seen the graphs where when you look at some of the mental health issues that, you know, to Dr. Acton's point, a lot of this started well before COVID. 2007, you know, what happened in 2007, right? The iPhone. And when you look particularly at, at younger adults and teens, you know, that's when a lot of, I think, w you know, we can pinpoint and say, well, this is when it started. And so I think it's easy as a society for us to say technology is the problem and stop there, but it, it has to be part of the solution. Um, we can't just go back to the way the world is just never gonna be again. And so when I look at older adults, um, we now have over 75% of older adults over 65 are using the internet. Um, and wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if we could connect them with all these young people who are on their phones, right? <laughs> I was just going to add that I agree it's such a double-edged sword because in many ways it is helping us build social connection, social connection, helping us foster relationships with people we already know. You know, I love uploading photos of my son and seeing people who don't live in this state and I get to share raising him with them, right? And so we're, we get to build that connection because we know each other and we have some commonality. But there are all these risks because you have that fear of missing out, that FOMO of you see all these people and they only show you one side of life and you think your life is not going as well because your life doesn't look as beautiful or as pretty as, as theirs or you might be experiencing that cyberbullying that was mentioned. But I also think that it oftentimes the iPhone and technology grab so much of our attention that we miss out on other ways to connect. And so what ends up happening is you could be around your dining room table, but you're all on your phone. And so what ends up happening is you're missing out on deeper connection with people right in front of you because you're, you're on your phone, right? And that is the part I think that's making the isolation and the loneliness harder because yes, I think teens are struggling sometimes to get off their phones because they you know, they create these devices so that we use them. Um, but the adults in their lives are also on those phones. And teens are saying, I wish my parent wasn't on that device so much, right? So I think we got to think about, like, yes, we have these devices. How do we use them balanced in a way that they do improve our connection, but they don't take away from that in-person time that we, we really need and desire? Oh open and reflective about the practice of using your phone and talk about the fact that like, hey, we, we need to put this down together and here's why. Um, so we took some time to break down um, what loneliness means a bit and just as important, we need to really question and understand what belonging means. Like what does that really look like? What does it mean? And so um, I wonder if we can, just like we talked about loneliness a bit, um, what are some characteristics of belonging so that we can be really intentional about cultivating that sense? I mean, I think, when I think of belonging, and again, I, my perspective is largely around 
trying to optimize people's mental health, sort of practicing preventative mental health, we call it. Something that we all really need to be working on and helping our kids and, and friends and families to work on. I think about everyone needs to feel as if they are needed. And, and that's what we see with many of these people who are isolated. They wanna feel like they're a part of something. A child may not be a star athlete, but that child needs to feel like there's a place where they belong. And I think one of the things we were talking about in preparing for this panel was how people can be together in a room full of people and they still feel alone. A child can be at school with a bunch of peers and a bunch of kids that in theory share similar interests and that child can feel really alone. So it's going beyond physical togetherness and helping each and every person in our community feel like there's a place for them where they're welcome and it's inclusive and where they feel needed. Yeah, so something uh, Megan said that I loved um, was having that purpose. Like that's when you know you're really tapping into belonging. It's, it's being seen, it's being heard, it's being known, but then it's like having that greater purpose. And I love Gen Z almost as much as I love older adults, because um, I live with several of them, um, which, as you know, is a challenge <laughs> for those of you who are close to Gen Z. Um, but the one thing about Gen Z, you know, a lot of people are down on Gen Z. They're always on their phones. They're kind of lost. They've got all these weird habits. And, you know, it's hard to connect, right? One thing I love about Gen Z, they're like the most volunteering generation we've ever seen on this planet. Like two thirds of Gen Zers are volunteering. And it's like, they're looking for that purpose. Like this is amazing. Like this is a group of people who wanna give back. And so that just gives me a lot of hope. I was gonna add, we at On Our Sleeves created this wonderful content on belonging this year. And what I loved about the work that one of my colleagues, Will Lever, um, did a literature review about belonging. And he, and he talked a lot about how it will, it's innate. We all need to feel like we belong. And there's these components to belonging. We have to have skills to belong. You have to know how to talk to people, <laughs> make friends. You have to have the opportunity, right? You gotta have, you know, people around or the, you know, the more isolated people are or places where there are limited resources, unfortunately, those can often then leave you with less opportunity. Um, you have to have that motivation to want to. And then the key, I think, too, is that perception, right? Like your personal feeling about how you belong in that room because everyone in the room can actually think you belong. They look at you and they think you're so smart and you do all these great things and we love that you're here. But if you don't have that inward perception of that belonging, it doesn't work. And so sometimes I think it's important to talk to yourself a little bit and look at your thoughts a little bit to see like, you know, I might be talking myself out of not belonging. Right, and that's sometimes, that's with the work with the kids that I do all the time, it's that talk and, and what are they saying to themselves and helping them see opportunities where maybe they thought this person doesn't like you, but they really revere you and, and, and adore you. Um, and so helping them to see that, I think is also important with belonging. And then I would add, you know, we're thinking about this individually and certainly it's hidden in plain sight, you know, one in two people are experiencing it right now, but it's invisible. Um, but it's in our community level too, as you were saying. So what are we a community that makes people feel like they belong? And, and intentionally creating that is a vital, vital part of this. Um, in workplaces, when, when you are feeling lonely or isolated, your productivity goes down. In schools, you don't do as well. Um, creating places where we matter. This is one of the things I loved um, at the Columbus Foundation. You know, we talk a lot about kindness, and I remember trying to say, you know, kindness is not weakness. It is not a fluffy concept. It's something that you have to intentionally, intentionally build. It's age-old, enduring principle in every religion, in every society, scientifically proven. Um, when you do it inwardly, one of the hardest to do, as everyone is saying, um, that can change you. When you do it outwardly in service to one another, 
that, that changes your neurochemistry. Um, we had a researcher, she's still there, Heather Tsavaris, who did research on belonging after working for the State Department, um, dealing with people who became suicide bombers and what was going on and how was that taken advantage of. And so this mattering and belonging is essential to our contract, um, this recipro reciprocity, the as reciprocal nature of our life together. But what we're suffering from right now, worldwide and certainly in this country, where we're seeing one another as not a part of the same team, as not having the same value set that we all cherish, even though when you get with anyone individually, you find it again. So this is a collective uh, challenge to us as well as at our individual level. And what kind of response since, especially since the Surgeon General, you know, came out with this with this announcement or this warning, what kind of community level response have we seen? You know, we have been talking a lot about the individual things that we can do, our interpersonal, you know, connections, but have we seen an active response at the at more of a community level? Yeah, I think we need to do more. Um, the good news is we're talking about it. I am seeing us talk about it um, as an organization. We're trying to lean in and think about, you know, how can we make sure every older adult that we serve doesn't just get a roof or a service or it's not transactional. How do we go from making what we do transactional to relational? That's that's the question, and I think we're talking about it. You know, we're putting things in place. One of the things I'm most proud of is, you know, our chaplaincy program has grown, and regardless of your background or your faith tradition, you know, our chaplains are available in Central Ohio to talk with any older adult. Um, we just started a program in New Jersey and New York, just hot off the press that I'm so excited about too, where older adults can call a chaplain and just talk about anything. Um, I've even started to call some of the older adults in our communities and just thank them, those, especially those who are giving back. Um, and by the way, you don't want to schedule those unless you have <laughs> time. <laughs> you can't fit that into a 20-minute meeting. Um, but, you know, we're taking steps, but are we doing enough? No, no. It's, it's so much more needs to be done. Yeah. I agree. I, I think we're trying to do little things, big things. You know, I think a lot of organizations have really put a big focus on wellness. And I know that's that's something we've done a really good job. I'm really proud of, of what we've done in that space um, at Ohio Health. And for me, it's easy, right? Because every day I deal with people with mental health crises and part of what we have to do for them is as a part of safety and disposition planning is optimizing that connectedness and social support. We view that as such a, you know, known protective factor for suicide. Um, but even in your day-to-day -day work, whatever you do for your job, whatever you do every day, there are these little ways that you can check in with people and that you can connect with people. And that's a lot of what our wellness department does. I mean, we have a head of physician wellness and a head of associate wellness. That's their full-time job to just look out for everybody's wellness. And so we even talk to our managers about how do you check in with your team? Like, it sounds kind of obvious, right? But what's the scripting? How do you have that conversation? Because not everybody's comfortable doing that. And I think by sort of approaching it from all these different angles, we just start to chip away little by little. And then we look to our community partners. We have such a good team um, of mental health partners here um, in Central Ohio. And you know, we share ideas. Whenever we do something that works, we share it with Ohio State. And we share it with Mount Carmel and the Adam Board. And you know, we all kind of work together, but I think it has to be little and big things. And, and a lot of these things are happening, but you're right, like more needs to be happening for sure. Yeah, and, and we were just talking over lunch, like we're already starting to share some ideas because I think we're doing things individually, but I don't think yet we're at the point of where we're doing it together, yeah. I've been, I've been really excited about the increase in population health just in the five plus years I've been in Columbus, I've seen so many initiatives. And I think that what makes population health work the best is when we're not working in our silos, we're working together. And so, you know, I work at the Linden Primary Care Office, so I know a lot about 
what I see many organizations like Nationwide Children's coming together to build with the community um, on the assets that the community has. Because people live in communities, and we know that that is a way in which they can connect. So when I'm there doing the parenting program that I do in the rec center and we're building connection, that's not just you know me doing that, but that's other organizations all working together. And you know when people are mentoring, that's other organizations. So I think we are doing things there's still work to do, but I'm, I'm hoping we're building roadmaps um, that are la uh, laying a foundation so we can kind of continue that on that work and making um, connection and belonging a part of the population um, initiatives that are happening in the state. It's important also to look um, to other regions and areas to see, you know, what they're doing. And I wonder, we, I know we talked a little bit about some of the initiatives that are happening in the UK right now and, and positions that have been appointed by the government. I wonder if you could share a little bit about that. We, we had a little chat over email about those. So, I, you know, my first question is always, whose job is it <laughs> to create the conditions in which we can all flourish and, and, and live up to our potential. And when we do that, we know that feeling of all ships rising. And right now, you know, if you think about Columbus, is there someone whose job it is to help us be the most connected, um, caring, compassionate city where people feel like they belong? So that's a question I always begin with. And I, everywhere, I could name so many things that are going on here um, and, and regionally. For instance, um, doing parks and libraries are a huge part of the Surgeon General's strategy for us to have healthier, well lives. But having access for everyone is so important. Intergenerational programs that have, you know, we have examples here in town of children and elderly being in the same building and, and helping one another. Um, in the UK, they actually created a position um, nationally, and then those positions exist locally. What the job is helping neighborhood groups come together, it's helping schools do different things and teach the skills about how to connect with one another. Um, it's happening in service programs. But there really is, this is so profound an effect on our well-being. If it is the underlying cause of despair and our disconnect, if our civil society, we rely on this democracy, on, on this belief that we're in this together. You know, we have a lot of these false arguments about, you know, our freedoms, which we are all, all cherished as a part of the system, our, our community and connected things. But the truth is, we're interconnected. We are absolutely, if a pandemic could not show the fact that there's a shortage of amoxicillin in the ER because of a supply chain, everything this pandemic taught us, common enemy, same enemy, aliens invading from outer space, one enemy we all shared. But what does it call us to do with one another when those things get tough? And so our fabric moving forward, and I don't say this to be depressing, I say that this is exactly the moment where we get a chance to co-create the world we wanna live in. You know, we're, we're still reverberating from all this, but there is a reckoning we must do because we won't move on if we don't. And the Surgeon General's report, which is wonderful to read, it has a whole strategic plan industry by industry suggestions, and that work is growing. There are other countries that are a little bit farther along in this work. Um, there are data measures. There are tech standards. There's a real uh, want to help entrepreneurs create and incentivize entrepreneurship around technology that connects us, because it can do good as well as bad. There are policies that can be done that are different, that actually incentivize relationships. And then I hope we can circle back to what you can do, but I'll leave it. I would just say that the Surgeon General's advisory opinion is, 
is a really great read. Um, if you haven't read it, it's easy to download. It covers so many things and more. It gives so many great points and ideas. I think, you know, sitting up here and talking about it, the thing that just flashed into my mind was, you know, I was a child of the 70s, and I remember when the Surgeon General gave the um, advisory on smoking. I don't know how many of you remember that. Um, but I happened to have had a father who was a chain smoker. And, you know, as a child, I created these little signs, little warnings, and I would leave them by his pack of cigarettes, okay? <laughs> and lo and behold, he did, you know, stop smoking later in life. Um, he's since passed on. Um, but we still laugh about that today. And I think, who's, are, are we taking this advisory that seriously. I mean, have we really launched a campaign as families, as a community? Um, you mentioned the Minister of Loneliness in the UK, you know, have we done that? I don't know that we have. I know I haven't. I, I haven't created signs in my teenagers' rooms, you know, <laughs> saying, watch for signs of loneliness. Are you on your phone too long? Um, but in all seriousness, I mean, I, I do think um, that we are at a moment here. And that advisory opinion, that was, that was a big deal. Like, it, it really was. And so what's next? You know, that's what we're here talking about. It did take, um, I'm sorry, it did take a long time to get there, you know, and the Surgeon General has a book out, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy. He has a book called Together. Um, the, the Healing Power of Connection in an Otherwise Lonely World. There is an On Being, if for those of you who have her, I'm a huge Krista Tippett fan. I think this is one of the most powerful interviews, On Being, uh, a podcast with him, where they really can talk what motivated this work and what he has seen um, traveling this country and, and hearing everyone's stories. Um, so those are some tools to go learn more. So it's the CMC's long-standing tradition to take audience questions. So we'll move to questions from our live stream and in-person audience in just a few moments. And if you have questions, please make your way over to the microphone in the back now. And if you're watching online, please type your questions into the chat. But before we take audience questions, I have one more question for you all. So we, we talked about sort of a call for action, right? You know, we talked about, um, you know, at the, at the community level, things are slowly start, you know, starting to happen. But, um, you know, what is your call to action for our audience today? What, what would you like everyone to, you know, walk away ready to do or ready to think about? Um, ready to connect over. I never, ever underestimate the importance, the impact of a kind word, of just reaching out to somebody at some point in your day. I, I would just challenge you. You never know what people are struggling with. And you have no idea how many people have told me when I said, well, you've had these bad thoughts about wanting to die most of your life, what's kept you alive, or, or what kept you from doing this act yesterday? And they'll say, well, I talked to this officer, one of your protective services officers, who just kind of made me feel heard and made me feel like somebody cared and helped me to kind of see things in a different perspective. So a kind word, a human connection, a conversation, it doesn't have to be anything major. It can just you know, check in with somebody, see how their day was, ask them a question, about something, especially if you see a warning sign that somebody might be struggling. Just know that you can make a huge difference. Um, I would say just think about the older adults in your life. And when you think about them, think about them as part of the solution when we talk about the loneliness epidemic. Don't think about them as part of the problem, you know, the people who are away and not part of society. Um, because as I just get to know and love and care for more older adults, 
I just see how they are such part of the solution. They're wise, they wanna give back. I think there's something between, um, I love that we're bookends here. You know, She's at Children's Hospital, I'm at National Church Residences. Um, there, there's something here about the power of these different generations at this moment in history that we need to tap into. So I was thinking, I had so many that I could leave with. Um, but I think we have to build on our culture of connection. And when we're talking about young people, they rely on us as adults to be trusted people who can model how to do this. And so reaching out to them, demonstrating how to do it, giving them the opportunities to engage, build their skills, process, um, they need us. And you know, the stats are there because I think so many times we think you know, one and two, and we think, oh, not me. But there's probably lots of people in this room who are also having challenges. And I want you to know that we have to also break that cycle that we have, and we have to reach out. I have to tell myself that sometimes too. Like I have to reach out when I'm having a hard time, um, and we have to encourage our kids to do the same and model those things because that's going to help us to, the more isolated we are, we can't connect, right? And so we have to figure out ways to break that cycle. Thank you. Um, I, I had a breakfast this morning with um, Franklin County Children's Services where they were graduating kids out of the system. Um, sharing the story of my, my childhood, and having a sort of rough time growing up. And I often think about the people. Um, there are people who would look the other way when they see something, it's uncomfortable, it's hard. Um, they didn't want their kids to play. And then I think about people who didn't, people who saw and, and did something. So at that very basic level, I just, just was reminded of it again today. You know, that's the stuff that saves lives and gives you hope and lets you know you matter when you might otherwise fall through the cracks. Um, individually, the Surgeon General talks a lot about if you could take 15 minutes uh, each day, not just with your family, but somebody somewhere in your network from your life to just reach out to them, and whether it's virtually, whether it's better yet talking, and, and reach out to someone. Make that sort of something you consciously do for your centeredness and well-being. And then when you're interacting, really looking, really trying not to be distracted. Like for that 15 minutes, just very much be there. And that, that's so incredibly powerful. Just a little bit of these things will go a long way when you start to notice something changing even in yourself and your sense of the world we're living in right now. Larger than that, obviously, service of any kind, getting involved and participating in reweaving our fabric, whether it's in your workplace, in your school, if you are involved in civic life or in nonprofit life, we can't wait. I learned this during the pandemic. There is no Calvary coming other than us. And it begins with us realizing that we have to co-create this world that we want to be a part of. And then at the larger level, obviously, this will sound kind of, um, before I do larger, counterintuitive, one last thing from the Surgeon General is solitude, which is different than loneliness. But we actually all, for our well-being, need space to be intentional and reflect on things. And maybe for you, it's listening to music. Maybe for somebody else, it's meditation. It's a spiritual thing. But you need space to remember what our values are. What values are you living? Because we think about success as boxes we check off and ladders we climb or money and power. And having, as a physician, and I'm sure you share this, been bedside as people are still learning and still changing in those last moments of life. And we all know that the answer was relationships. That is the thing that mattered most to them. And these values we hold dear, whether it be the way we can trust one another, care for one another, be compassionate, 
we want to live in a world, the one we teach in like the Mr. Rogers and the Sesame Streets to our kids, and then somehow we have to grow up and not be that. It's, it is, in a strange way, amazingly simple. If it was in pill form, we'd be popping it. <laughs> and, but it, it, it rests with us. And the well, well-being, I always think of as the well of our being. So you actually need some time for that before you go out there and do this. Thank you. All right, so now Doug Buchanan with the CMC is curating questions from our live stream audience. Tracy, thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> for those of you with us here in person, um, again, join Doug over at the microphone if you have uh, questions. Thank you, and thank you to today's panelists. This is a great conversation. We're getting a lot of questions online, even more than we typically do. Um, uh, please do uh, come join us here at the microphone if you have a question. Keep in mind, great questions at CMC have two things in common. They take less than 30 seconds to ask, and they do end with a question mark. Uh, here, here's one from Carol Looper that checks both those boxes. Carol Looper asks, uh, widowhood is a cause of loneliness. Are there specific coping mechanisms? I will take that one. Um, I would say being part of a community. If, if we look at you know the number one factor in longevity study out of Harvard that's now running 80 years, it's you know, to Dr. Acton's point, it's relationships. That's the number one factor. And so losing that relationship is profound, it's hard. Um, what we've seen time and time again, the more you can surround yourself with community. Um, communities is really the thing um, that, you know, will, will help. I would just add, Carol, we still miss Fred. So just wanna say, he's still with us. Thank you for this great panel. My name is Eric Davies. Uh, my question, I'll start off with a question and then end with a question. It makes CMC very happy here. But is um, emotional connection, like deeper emotional connection and vulnerability, a part of ending loneliness and getting past loneliness? And I ask this, too, because as a male and men, we are socialized not to connect emotionally and deeply and to not be vulnerable. And it's, it's a cultural and social issue that leads to a lot of loneliness, I believe, and a lot of anger and a lot of rage, actually, among men in our society. And um, so is emotional, true, deep emotional connection necessary? And if so, how do we begin to shift this paradigm uh, for everyone, but particularly men who I think really uh, struggle with this? So I ask this panel of women. Thank you. The Surgeon General really talks about, you know, we have these two drives, and we went, you know, in working on kindness at the Columbus Foundation, again, it, people want to see this thing as fluffy, but we talked a lot about um, love and hate. Um, during the pandemic, there was the mom who did the act on love, not hate signs that went around, and so we talk about this during the pandemic, you know, act on love, not hate, kindness, not fear. Now. Love and fear are two things, drives that we have in us to this connect, but also fear, we're wired to survive, so fear plays a role. And fear often manifests in things like um, despair, but also anxiety, that sort of reaction, and also rage. And I, I think in feeling separate, sometimes those are actually more compelling emotions to give into that they feel stronger. Um, Kurt Vonnegut in his books would talk about, you know, hate is just so, man, it gets more airtime. It's just so compelling, you know, like it, to give in to that. Um, and certainly we have a lot of folks suffering. If one in two people right now have measurable levels, like past that initial level I was talking about, you know, it's pretty profound. And then if we have a world around us, um, quite honestly, you know, again, bad actors taking advantage. Uh, of that, or if it's more, you know, it sells more media, but literally, quite literally, people um, who gain by creating separation. Um, it, it makes for a very vulnerable po population. And that said, all of us, um, with very, very few exceptions of people suffering from, you know, we would talk about, it's very, very rare 
that, that someone doesn't have that capacity innately in them and a longing for that. It's interesting that you bring up um, men in particular. Um, we know for a fact that men are less likely to reach out and get help if they're struggling with mental health problems like depression and anxiety. And so I think you're really onto something. How do we start to chip away at that? Well, I think if we look bigger picture, we've really started to chip away at the mental health stigma. Think about how much we're talking about mental health now. I mean, this younger generation, they love talking about going to a therapist and they are all about it. They are all about like, I'm missing my whole tour because I have to work on my mental health. I mean, it's really remarkable. I think we have to start to do the same thing specifically around men's mental health. And you know, I think on the smaller scale, the everyday scale, that's reaching out to male friends that you have and, and getting groups together, whether it's you know, doing activities or I don't know, poker or playing a sport or you know, going for a run, whatever it may be, um, but also having conversations with our young men about how do you feel? It's okay if you're not feeling great. You know, it's good to reach out and get help. And if you older men and middle-aged men, you know, set a good example, then that shows the younger men it's, it's okay to have these issues and it's the right thing to do to reach out and get help. Okay, it's, it's okay for this to be fun. It doesn't, you know, this, you know, one project in Indianapolis um, goes around and doesn't ask older folks what they need. They say, what, what are you really, what are you joyful about? Like they, they, they actually lead with what are you excited about as a way to connect. So don't think it's about, you know, our suffering. It's, it's being with. A lot of times you can't fix things in life. I mean, right, you can't, you can't cure, but you can be a part of healing by being with and holding space. And so whatever that space is, if it is the um, eclipse that held space for all of us, and we felt that feeling again, um, whether it's a sports thing, whatever it is, lean into that being with. And it's okay, I just wanna add, this is for introverts and extroverts, rich and poor, this knows no boundaries. You know, being an introvert is a thing, again, solitude is something that is healthy. It, it is, a, the feeling of loneliness is a painful, despairing feeling, and, and, and there's a difference. Hi, I'm uh, Casey Goldstein. I own All Paul's Retreat, which is a dog daycare and boarding facility in town. Um, so naturally, I deal with a lot of people that love animals, and animals is a very easy way for us to connect. So can you speak to any research on the benefits of dogs or having animals within people's lives and how that helps with belongingness? I was just um, uh, taking part um, in a book with the, the dean of our vet school. Um, and his dream is that Columbus could be this um, pet-centric city. So you imagine pets are so healing. There's tons of science on the profound impact on health, especially um, elderly having a pet. We know about care animals. Um, one of the things that most moved me in Columbus was a documentary on our homeless population. You know, a lot of people won't go into shelter because they won't leave the animal behind. So how do, again, we create a world that allows for this? You know, you think of Jeff Edwards' new Rapid Five and the new walkway that Jeff is doing, and we could be eating outside and we're running into each other more because we've created a more communal thing, and maybe it should be pet friendly <laughs> as well. And so these are all parts of connection for a lot of people, especially people who have had trauma, animals, for kids, they can talk, right? The animal just looks and doesn't, doesn't, you know, always there for you. It's a huge part of our healing. There's a concept called One Health. The world is, we are, are, are human health and well being, animal well being, and the environment are one system. It's a G7 concept now. So to think that these things aren't all intertwined and that um, we are only as well as as those around us, including our pets. I just wanted to say thanks for the question um, because we haven't talked about that and I am not personally aware of research on pets and loneliness, but I have seen research on pets and mental health and some of the research that I've seen over the years has shown that it can um, 
better your mental, mental health by, I think I've seen up to 50% in some studies. So it's, it really is profound and, and I think it's a great call out. It's an important part of the loneliness solution. Thank you. We have about two minutes left. We'll try to get to at least a couple more questions. Jessica Spain, uh, watching online, says, uh, do we think that working from home has led to more disconnection in the workplace? Uh, if so, are there ways we can overcome that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I know, at least in the hospital, it was interesting because during COVID, I think this goes for all hospital systems, there were certain people that had to stay at the hospital and then certain people that didn't. And so it kind of broke things up a little bit. And um, now that, you know, post-COVID, people are kind of getting back into the hospital or have gotten back into the hospital. One of the things I've found, since some people have shifted to hybrid or they've shifted to working from home, is trying to make sort of a, an, an effort, a very deliberate effort to get everybody together in person, whether it be weekly. I just had a, somebody in the emergency department the other day who was looking forward to this meeting with her coworkers that only happened on a Wednesday. I think it was a happy hour type thing, but um, make it whatever you want to make it. But I think it is really important to have that in-person connection. And I, I definitely have seen people who have become socially isolated because they work from home. And if they aren't making that active effort to connect in person with their colleagues and with other people, it, it can be very isolating. So everyone, I wish we had more time, but I'm getting the wrap-up signal. Uh, so we're gonna turn it over to Sophia for concluding remarks. Thank you. Wow. It's so hard when we have to end our conversations that part of me feels so sad because I feel like we're just getting ramped up. Um, what an incredible topic today. And for I just want to call out for those who are experiencing extreme bouts of loneliness or a mental health crisis, you know, you can certainly call or text 988, the National Suicide uh, Crisis Lifeline. You know, Dr. Amy Acton, you mentioned that this is a chance for us to create the world where we all want to live in. You know, and it begins with us. And I think that for those who are members of the CMC who have joined our conversations either in person or online, that it's easy to hear this information and think, oh, well, this is something that Gen Z is dealing with. This is something that impacts the silent generation, and perhaps not you personally. But as Dr. Whitney Ragnall Big, Bignall, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing that last name correctly, you know, it, it requires us, you and I, in this room, those who are connecting with us online, to build up the skills, the motivation, and perception to create the world that we want to live in. I am, I wake up every single day with so much joy because every day the CMC gets to bring people together to center around our mission, which is connecting community, connecting people and ideas every single week. And it is up to us to weave together the world where we all belong. So with that, I wanna thank the Ohio State University, Nationwide Children's Hospital, and Ohio Health. I wanna thank the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and National Church Residencies for supporting today's conversation. Can we give them one more round of applause? We're so grateful to be in this space, the Ellis, and from our partners with the Columbus Dispatch for presenting our live stream, as well as the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream. I'd also want to give one big round of applause to our panelists, Dr. Amy Acton, Dr. Whitney Ragnall Bignall, Dr. Susan DeMichael, Dr. Megan Schaubing, and to our host, Tracy McCambridge. Thank you all for a wonderful conversation. Let's give them another round of applause. All right, for those who are tuning in online and you're looking for that weekly connection to connect with other people, I hope that you can join us next week for Pathways to Prosperity, Breaking the Poverty Cycle in Central Ohio. And for those in the room, I invite you to join us as well. Thank you again for supporting our mission and investing in community conversations. Have a great day. <laughs>